We'd like to welcome today uh, the um, Honorable Minister of Trade and Investment of Malaysia, Dr. Kseri Mustafa Mohammed. Welcome to Washington, sir. Thank you, Odi. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, uh, you and Prime Minister Najib have been um, setting out an ambitious plan to transform Malaysia's economy. Uh, the, that plan is called the National Economic Model, or the NEM. Could you talk about what your motivation is to make these changes, and, and what are the key pillars of the plan? We became a middle-income developing country in about uh, 20 years ago. We've graduated. We one of the target economies uh, in the world. Uh, but of course, uh, the uh, financial crisis of 1978 and the recent economic uh, financial meltdown had an impact on us. Uh, and uh, our rate of growth uh, has not been as high as what it was in the 1990s. Uh, some of our peers have overtaken us, and we believe we have to work harder in order to for Malaysia to join the ranks of a developed economy. So the main motivation uh, is to, uh, to be a developed economy by 2020. Uh, that has been our ob objective, but th that objective uh, is in danger uh, unless we change the way we do things. Uh, the main pillars of this uh, new model is to, of course, to increase the incomes of every Malaysian, uh, to make it inclusive so, so that every uh, Malaysian has a share in this uh, growing prosperity to reduce gaps between the rich and the poor, the urban and the rural. And another pillar is to, uh, to make growth sustainable. That's got to do with, with the environment. So, but the bottom line is uh, income, a high level of income. Uh, we believe we've got the potential. Uh, we have the resources, uh, we have the human talent, but we need to have a big push. Uh, and that push has been provided by the leadership of, of the Prime Minister uh, in the form of, of the new economic model. The, um, we saw an announcement this morning, I think, from the Prime Minister in New York about the uh, Economic Transformation Program, or the EPT, and, and some of the um, National Key Economic Area Labs. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about, about those? Elements? We've identified uh, 12 sectors, uh, plus uh, what we call the Greater KL Region. Uh, our aspiration is to turn KL, Kuala Lumpur, the capital city, to be a truly global city, to be a magnet for human talent, for businesses. Uh, so there are 12 areas altogether. What's different now is that there's focus. Uh, there's uh, a considered effort on the part of government and the private sector. What has happened in the last few months is that the government and the private se sector, we've come together to brainstorm and to go into detail uh, what particular areas, uh, uh, you know, has have the potential to be developed? For example, in electrical electronics, we have been stuck at the bottom. Yeah, we've been doing a bit of uh, assembly, but we've not gone to design and development. Mm -hmm. uh, so going forward, under the new economic model, the economic transformation is to move up the value chain. In palm oil, for example, we've been uh, there's been some. Uh, uh, downstream activities, but there's not enough of that. So the intention is to go deeper into downstream activities. Oil and gas, we believe uh, we've got the potential to be the regional hub in the region. So uh, we're going to develop uh, this sector. So these are some examples. What's different now is that there's focus. Uh, there, is, there are people who have been assigned uh, to monitor very closely. It's a, dip, uh, it's a new way of doing things. It's not just a statement of intentions, but it's also the follow-through, the follow-up, and a mechanism to monitor very closely to ensure that all these ambitious goals uh, are being implemented. Do these plans allow you to uh, allow Malaysia to plug into global uh, trade agreements more easily? I mean, have you sort of raised the level and, and addressed areas like you know that, that have been um, uh, challenging in the past, like procurement? Uh, is is that part of the plan at all? Well, that's part of uh, transparency, mm -hmm. governance. Uh, the, uh, we have another program called the Government Transformation Program. Uh, and one important issue we have tried to address is governance and transparency. And that's very much uh, at the core of some of these agreements that we have been uh, discussing with our trading uh, partners. Although FTAs are, are not you know, one of those areas under the economic transformation program, but it's certainly very relevant. Uh, we are a small open economy, we believe in free trade, 
that's been our policy to engage with the world. You know, we have to depend on the world. We have been one of the major beneficiaries of an open trading regime. Uh, it is very natural for us uh, to come on board uh, and be part of the, uh, this, uh, this uh, movement uh, for uh, more open trade. Mm. And for that reason, uh, we are not only committed to ensure the success of AFTA, the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, the success of the ASEAN Economic Community, but we've been engaging with our uh, trading partners with Australia, with China, with South Korea, with Japan, with Pakistan, with Turkey. These are some examples. Mm. Uh, some we have, uh, we have uh, signed trade agreements and uh, our negotiation with India, for example, is very advanced. Uh, we have ASEAN has signed a trade agreement with India, but Malaysia is having a bilateral uh, trade agreement, agreement in India. India is, is a big country, very important country. I've been personally, personally involved in this discussion and I'm pleased uh, uh, to share with you that uh, there's been good progress. So Malaysia uh, uh, accords very high priority to uh, the conclusion uh, of uh, trade agreements, not only with our ASEAN neighbors, which, which is already in place, but also with uh, our major trading partners. Mm. I, I was with uh, your colleague from New Zealand, uh, Tim Grosser, yes. earlier this morning, and uh -huh. he had the highest, uh, the highest compliments for you and, and Malaysia, and he talked about New Zealand's uh, good success in, in being able to work out some partnerships. Yeah, we've been able to, uh, we've been discussing a trade agreement with New Zealand for a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, first August, I think, uh, it was finally implemented, but it's been a long process. It was signed last year, you know, before our two KMs, right. Prime Minister Malaysia Energy and Prime Minister New Zealand, and we were the ones uh, who signed it. And that was a momentous. New Zealand is a small country, but it is a very important trading partner for us, and it is a high quality agreement. And there were some challenges, but because we are we are both committed to free trade, uh, we have decided to put put whatever differences we have, and there's been uh, some compromises, and now uh, a trade agreement is in place and it is implemented. Uh, and we believe this will further stimulate trade between Malaysia and New Zealand. Yeah, well, congratulations on that. You know, um, I know how important foreign investment is to Malaysia. And, you know, looking at the numbers over the last three years, I think Bloomberg pointed out uh, uh, two days ago in a, in a press, uh, press piece that uh, investment has been down uh, over the last, foreign investment has been down over the last three years, but it now seems to be surging back under under your leadership and, and that of Prime Minister Najib. Um, what, and we've seen, you know, major companies like global companies, global brands like Coca-Cola and Ace Insurance come back to Malaysia with significant new investments. How do you explain that revival? You know, what's, what's going right? Firstly, uh, let's go back into history. Okay. Uh, FDIs have played a very important role foreign investments have opened up our rubber plantations, mm. uh, the tin mines, it was a British in the beginning, uh, and uh, in the 1970s uh, we went aggressively to promote uh, electronics and we're now one of the biggest uh, locations for semiconductors in the world. So we've been successful uh, in the past and we've been attracting a steady flow of foreign direct investment. But with the uh, financial crisis of 1997-98 and the recent meltdown, we have been one of the uh, countries uh, adversely affected. Uh, having said that, of course, uh, in the last uh, few months in particular, we've seen a revival of interest uh, in Malaysia, and Malaysia is uh, coming back again on, 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 on the map, on the radar right, right screen. Uh, Ace, uh, for example, uh, an American insurance company, decided to come to Malaysia because of the reform that Dr. Sin Najib has put in place. Before this, uh, an insurance a foreign insurance company can own only 49% of equity uh, in a Malaysian insurance company. But uh, uh, the Prime Minister announced uh, in May, I think last year, that a uh, foreign company can uh, buy up to 70%. Right. And that's a motivation uh, for Ace to come into Malaysia. So what has happened is that uh, I think uh, foreign companies, have, uh, foreign investments are, uh, are excited about the reform which uh, the new administration has, uh, has put in place, uh, a more liberal environment, a more open environment, uh, more relaxed equity conditions. Uh, there was uh, one uh, rule, it's called, it's called the Foreign Investment uh, Committee Guidelines. Uh, many investors were against it, both foreign and local as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our Prime Minister decided to 
do away with the repeal of those rules and regulations. And that was welcomed by, by many foreign investors. And in April, uh, he announced the opening up 27 sub-service sectors. So uh, although, of course, it takes a while uh, before uh, this interest on the part of foreign investors uh, you know, uh, can be um, attracted to Malaysia, but we're beginning to see. I, I'm a straight minister, of course, I, I travel a bit throughout the world, uh, and I can see a renewed interest uh, in Malaysia. So uh, we, this is a welcome development. It's got to do with uh, uh, the reforms which are being put in place. Uh, and going forward, uh, I believe the momentum is going to steady, steadily pick up. Mm. Talking about the, the benefits of reform and the, and the good response of, of investors is, is one side of it, of course. But uh, we all know, and in fact, Americans in particular, it seems, know that the politics, domestic politics around trade aren't easy to manage. Um, could you talk a little bit about the politics of, of trade and reform in, in Malaysia? How are you how are you and the Prime Minister selling this to Malaysians and, and do you see any risks to the reform? Uh, let, me, let me begin with uh, trade. Mm. Uh, as Metis Minister, uh, I'm convinced that the way forward for Malaysia is to open up its economy and uh, it's not easy. I mean, people are being comfortable. Uh, being protected yeah, for many, many years, for many decades. Right. Uh, and uh, we have to market this idea to them that uh, open trade is good for you. Uh, there's been resistance, uh, but uh, I think the commitment of the Prime Minister that we got to do things differently, and that's been been a big help uh, to all of us. I mean, coming from, from the top, the signal is really very clear. We have to open up and reform. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very difficult. I got to deal with my colleagues, you know, dealing with uh, various sectors of the economy uh, when it comes to uh, a free trade agreement. Uh, uh, of course, I got to uh, persuade them. It's not been easy, but uh, in the end, they've come around to accept uh, the need to open up. So that's as far as uh, trade is concerned. On the overall reform agenda, uh, of course, as, as an open society, as a democratic society, we have to deal with the uh, challenges. Yeah? and. Uh, there are people who are supportive of us, and of course there are others who have been com comfortable with the, uh, the level of protection provided by government. Uh, and uh, some people are comfortable with the way things are. Right? They do not want to change. Right. Uh, but the, the, the test of any uh, strong leadership is the ability and the courage uh, to move forward. And uh, uh, for us, there's no turning back. The only uh, road to success, the only route to success uh, is change, uh, unless we are prepared to change. We cannot be a developed country. We, we can be a middle-income developing country, as we've been for the last 20 years, but we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't think we can move up yeah. the income ladder unless uh, we implement radical changes. So it's about engaging with the, with the public, engaging with the various stakeholders. Yeah? Uh, the economic transformation program, for example, it is unprecedented in Malaysia's history, and so is the government transformation program. Uh, what has happened is that in the last few months, there's been a lot of engagement on the economic transformation program, for example, 21st, 22nd. Uh, we have what are called open days. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we share with the public, yeah, this is what the government want to do, uh, the 12 sectors. You will tell us, you know, is this good for us? And uh, we, we are, you know, the, the uh, institution concerned will be gathering feedback from the public. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this is uh, most welcome by the people and by this process of engagement with stakeholders, hopefully there will be buy-in and mm. hopefully there will be less opposition mm. to the uh, uh, radical changes we are putting in place in Malaysia. It sounds like a good plan and, and of course I guess if, if those investments flow in then you'll have strong job creation and that, that probably will, yeah. will help. Um, on the, uh, as, as you move to transform the economy into a high value economy, I assume one of the key performance indicators has to be enhanced education. Yes. And obviously, uh, you know, you know a lot about this in your previous role in the cabinet uh, related to education. Could you talk a little bit about um, what, what your view is, how important education is to this process and, and maybe some of the things that uh, the Malaysian government is doing in this area? We have uh, made a lot of, of strides in education in terms of uh, uh, literacy, in terms of uh, primary education. But the main issue uh, is quality, and secondly, the main issue is supply and demand to meet the requirements of industry. 
another issue is language. So those are the three main issues, quality, supply and demand, mm. and language skills. And when I, when I say language, it's not just English. It's got to do with foreign languages, Mandarin. Uh, uh, we have not been doing too well in that. I mean, we are in between China and India. Mm. Uh, we should have more people uh, speaking foreign languages. So that's one area. But the, the two biggest problems would be quality and matching supply and demand. Right. Let me take up the issue of supply and demand. Uh, for example, we have what we call the multimedia super corridor, which requires many ICT graduates uh, uh, of, of a certain standard. Uh, so there are challenges there. Uh, we're not producing enough numbers. So what, what we have done uh, is to have some uh, short-term measures. Uh, uh, we brought in Infosys uh, from India. We brought our students to, to the Infosys campus. Mm -hmm. So that's one, uh, one uh, way in which we try to uh, mesh the supply and demand. Mm -hmm. This sector is growing fast, the ICT sector in Malaysia, and demand is, is high. And we have a number of uh, successful uh, companies, global companies, uh, uh, which has decided to make Malaysia as a base for its regional operations. Yeah? Some of the most prominent American courier companies some of the biggest banks in the world mm -hmm. have got their, their, their uh, uh, data centers in Malaysia, but we need the skills. So that's one area. Then another is um, engineering. Yeah? Uh, we need people to do research and development. Uh, we need more PhDs. So the challenge for us is to produce more PhDs in engineering, more masters in engineering, and that's got to be ramped up quickly. And the government recognizes uh, the need to, uh, to, to, to get this done quickly. And at the end of this year, we're setting up the Talent Corporation. The Talent Corporation is about uh, enhancing the skills of Malaysians. It is also about attracting uh, Malaysian talent overseas. It is also about attracting the best talent globally. Uh, we have uh, tried this many times in the past. Uh, success has been limited, but with the uh, uh, commitment that we have uh, and the realization that unless uh, we improve the quality of higher education in particular, uh, it's going to be very tough for us to, to be a fully developed uh, nation. So uh, going forward, uh, we have put in place a number of uh, measures, including uh, getting um, industry and universities to collaborate uh, closer to each other, uh, getting all the research fundings in the universities to be commercialized. Uh, it's got to be a new way of doing things. Yeah. You, uh, you, ASEAN, Malaysia is obviously the third largest economy in, in in ASEAN, and ASEAN has been uh, moving uh, very aggressively uh, on some trade agreements with, with major partners. Has Malaysia benefited from these FTAs, and, and could you talk about the nature of those FTAs? I think some in the United States have the assumption that the ASEAN, or the, the some of the FTAs in Asia are, are less than uh, the standard uh, that, that a, an American uh, negotiator might pursue, but um, uh, Minister Grosser, for instance, was, was disabusing me of, of that idea earlier this morning. I'd be interested in your perspective on that. And also, um, if you could compare uh, or, or think about or talk about Malaysia's um, uh, trade policy, are you, uh, and how, the, how your involvement in the potential involvement in the, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership might fit into to that policy. May I begin by saying a few words about the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. First January 2010, yeah, uh, we have 97% uh, uh, of tariff lines at zero uh, within ASEAN. Uh, we are almost there, but by 2015, uh, we're supposed to have an ASEAN economic community, uh, zero tariffs uh, across the board in ASEAN. And ASEAN is uh, a region of uh, 580 million people, and uh, uh, there has been an uh, increase in intra ASEAN trade uh, from 15%, say 20 years ago, now it's about 25, 26%. Mm. So, in our view, uh, that's a direct result of the, uh, of the lowering down of tariff barriers within ASEAN. So, we're trading more among ourselves. Second would be uh, uh, ASEAN uh, FTAs with our trading partners. We have uh, got China, Japan, uh, uh, Korea, uh, India. Australia and New Zealand. So these are the FTAs which, which ASEAN and Malaysia as a, as a very active member of ASEAN of course, uh, we stand to benefit uh, from all these uh, free trade agreements. Yes, it is true that uh, any trade agreement has got exceptions. Yeah? 
but uh, these exceptions are very few in number. Uh, by and large, uh, we've been able to benefit from this uh, free trade agreement. Uh, before, tariffs were higher. Now, tariffs are lower, in some cases zero. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and our people have been responding. For example, uh, you look at the, the forms. Before you avail yourself, uh, you know, facility uh, accorded in the free trade agreement, you've got to, certain forms you've got to fill. Uh, looking at the, the number of forms being issued to exporters and also importers, yeah, there's been a fairly a big increase in the, in the volume of trade. So we have been a beneficiary uh, not only of uh, a free trade agreement among ASEAN members, but also between ASEAN uh, and its major trading partners. And ASEAN has been talking to uh, to the Gulf countries, for example, uh, to, to, to further uh, advance this agenda of trade liberalization. On TPP, um, this is uh, 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 and a new initiative uh, which is uh, propelled by eight countries. Uh, we have expressed our intention formally uh, to come on board. Uh, discussions uh, are quite advanced. Uh, my people were in Lima, Peru mm. uh, to engage with every country, uh, every one of the eight countries uh, which are in this process and uh, the report I get is that they all want unanimous uh, they all want Malaysia to be on board. Malaysia is a small country, but a very important trading nation in the world. And they are very um, excited uh, at the possibility of Malaysia being a full-fledged uh, participant in, in, in discussions on TPP. So we have expressed our intention, and we're getting a, a green light you know, from all these countries. Uh, and we hope this will come in the very near future. And once we are formally accepted uh, as a full participant, of course, we'll uh, be participating, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as a full-fledged uh, uh, member in this negotiating team. Mm. Hopefully that will happen soon. Well, that would be quite welcome. I mean, I guess that's the way we'll, we'll end up with uh, a U.S.-Malaysia FTA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were, as you know, uh, on that for a number of years. And now we have formally, uh, both of us have formally abandoned <laughs> the idea of having a bilateral FTA. This is a superior, superior solution. Uh, FTA, uh, TPP, uh, eight countries, and hopefully Malaysia will be one of them, will be the ninth country. Some of us in the uh, sort of the think tank sector have the luxury of being outside of government, so we're not constrained by uh, some of the statutory requirements. And, and I, I, for one, have sort of been pushing on the idea that the, the U.S. should probably uh, try to engage in a, in a free trade agreement with ASEAN. Um, how do other partners of ASEAN deal with the, the wide disparity of develop, levels of development in ASEAN? And um, I guess the, uh, of the countries you mentioned, Australia and New Zealand would also have had to deal with the, uh, the politics of, of the Burma issue. You've been at the table for these discussions. How are other partners dealing with those issues? First, as you know, uh, in general, we are uh, two groups of countries. One, the more advanced, uh, with Singapore, of course, uh, being a, a developed economy, and the other will be the lesser developed uh, economies of ASEAN. Uh, in many ways, because of the, uh, the vast uh, the, the, the levels of development, the big gap in levels of development, uh, the trade agreement we have signed with uh, Australia, New Zealand, or Japan, and the level of ambition has got to be a bit lower. But having said that, of course, it, it is a good agreement. Yeah? So that's how we deal uh, with uh, differences uh, within ASEAN, uh, by lowering the level of ambition to take into account uh, the level of development in some of these countries. The other way we deal with that is to, uh, uh, to uh, in terms of uh, tariff reduction, uh, if for the more developed economies, it's going to happen faster. Okay. So in the case of a, a lesser developed economies, uh, it is staggered. So that's how we deal uh, with the situation. Myanmar has, uh, has been uh, a difficult issue uh, uh, for uh, especially the Western world, but uh, in our part of the world, uh, it's not an issue. China has got very close ties with Myanmar. Uh, Japan has got close ties with Myanmar, South Korea, also in New Zealand. Uh, so Myanmar has never been an issue, but okay. when we talk to America, Europe, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, been toying with this idea of having uh, FTA between ASEAN and EU. Uh, and one step, something block, of course, uh, was uh, the status of Myanmar. Uh, so yes, uh, with some countries, Myanmar has been an issue, 
but uh, uh, in general, uh, we do not have any problem in dealing with our uh, Asian neighbors okay. uh, on this issue. M M Myanmar is it is not an issue at all. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, you you've been visiting the United States for the past week or so, I think, um, talking to uh, your counterparts and and American companies. And we know the U.S. is a major market for Malaysia, and, and Americans are some of the top investors in your country. Um, what's your mission here in the United States, and, and what sort of reactions are you getting to to uh, Malaysia and, and your pitch? How are Firstly, uh, I would like to uh, highlight the fact that uh, the new administration under Najib has decided that we should re-engage with America. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's been ups and downs in the relationship. Uh, and Najib has decided that we should uh, come here more often and uh, this is my second trip this year I would say in, in, in May I'm here again and it is quite unusual uh, for a trade minister of Malaysia to come here uh, two times in a year so that in itself is a clear demonstration of the commitment uh, to re-engage and to talk to our counterparts uh, as well as uh, American companies uh, I must say that uh, the results so far have exceeded my own expectations. Eh? I was in Atlanta, I was in Philadelphia, and I'm now in Washington. Uh, especially the, the level of understanding about Malaysia. Yeah, I was quite impressed uh, that uh, many people uh, know us, yeah, the, uh, so corporate people. Yeah, uh, and the, the, I ran seminars in Atlanta and also in, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, they, they were attended by two groups of people, one people who are in Malaysia, another group of people who have not been to Malaysia. Among, especially among those who have been to Malaysia, they are happy doing business in Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. They are happy the service provided by MIDA, for example, the hand-holding, yeah, the facilitation. I mean, that's good news for us. And coming from, from them, from the bottom of their heart, uh, and I'm indeed uh, gratified. And uh, I met a few companies uh, which have decided to expand their operations, mm -hmm. existing operations, and uh, in some cases to go into new businesses. So as I said, uh, there has been, uh, uh, you know, these have exceeded my, my own expectations. But I can see there's a lot of goodwill in my discussions with Ron Kirk and uh, Ambassador Marantis and a few others, uh, members of one or two members of the U.S. Congress. Uh, I can see uh, that there's a lot more goodwill uh, there's better rapport, there's better understanding, and that's very much in line with, with the policy of, of the current government in Malaysia, which is to re-engage, uh, to develop closer collaboration. And America, as you know, is number two in Malaysia in terms of investment. Yeah? Uh, some, many of the top American names are in Malaysia, Intel, Dell, AMD, Coca-Cola, of course. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, GE, uh, they're there. Uh, and uh, I've been talking to some of them on this trip, and I'm pleased to know uh, that some of them have got uh, plans for, for Malaysia. Hopefully, uh, uh, investment flows uh, from America will go up. At the same time, I must remind you that Malaysia is also going abroad. Malaysians are mm -hmm. going abroad. Uh, our companies have gone to ASEAN, other parts of Asia, to China. Uh, one of our companies have gone to New York in the gaming <laughs> business, for example. Uh, so, Malaysian companies are also going out. Although at present they are in Asia, they go to India in construction, Middle East construction, banking in Asia. And there will come a time when Malaysian companies uh, will come to America. So it's a two-way kind of process. Right. I'm here to promote Malaysian exports. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, we need to be prepared to buy more from America. That's the nature of uh, any trade. It's got to be mutually beneficial. Right. So it's not just uh, Malaysian uh, me coming here to attract uh, American investments or to get America to buy more products is also about uh, Malaysians come to America at some point in time uh, to invest uh, in this country and also uh, Malaysians buying more for America and in the end you know it's going to benefit both of us. Mm -hmm. Well that that approach is is quite welcome and and actually we've seen the the Najib uh, the Najib paradigm if you will yeah. uh, outside of the trade area, also yeah. in security. Yeah, and security, education. Empathize. What we're going, uh, doing in Afghanistan, for example, yeah, the collaboration, uh, we're training the teachers, the police force, the medical team. Uh, this is, uh, as I say, this would not have happened uh, without the, uh, the close cooperation which has been put in place in the past one year between the two governments. Well, it's, it's quite so it's not of just trade investment, okay. it's gone. Of course, education has been there a long time. We have more than 100,000 Malaysians who have uh, 
uh, the qualifications in this country. Yeah. The uh, well, I note on education, you know, the number of Malaysian students in this country is it's what six thousand now. Yeah, but one time to be twice as many at least. Yeah, at one time there were twenty thousand. Yeah. During my time, I, I studied here as well. Uh, there were about twenty thousand students, Malaysian students here. And those were the days when we were when we were richer <laughs> or currency <laughs> was a lot stronger. <laughs> Well, also, the, I think the United States has some room to, to move forward on its education policy to make it easier for Malaysian and Asian students to come back to the United States. Yeah. This is an area that we're looking at at, at CSIS very closely. Yeah. Visa and all this, I mean, this. yeah. Exactly. What, uh, final question, um, since you're here and you've been kind enough to, to give us a, an interview, uh, I think the final question is, what advice do you have for Americans thinking about doing business in Malaysia, coming to Malaysia, you know, what should what should an American who may not have visited your country yet know about uh, know about Malaysia? Uh, firstly, uh, we've got uh, a number of offices here. Maida, which is involved in investment promotion, has got six offices. Mm -hmm. Matre, involved in uh, uh, trade promotion, got uh, three offices. Of course, we, we've got an embassy here in Washington, New York. So the, the first place to go, uh, we have people here. Yeah, so you know, good to see them. Uh, and we have uh, a strong team uh, in your embassy in, in Malaysia. They've been very supportive, helpful. They've been bringing Americans to Malaysia, not only big companies, also small guys, people in, in small business. We, we welcome them. Malaysia has got good infrastructure. Uh, many people speak English uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we have uh, good IP uh, protection. At one three, say five years ago, that was an issue with a number of American companies. And uh, now they're happy with the, uh, the system we put in place, including the setting up of IP courts, for example. Right. Uh, Malaysia is a good place to live. Uh, it's an open society. We are a moderate Muslim country. We are stable politically, politically, good infrastructure. So these are some of the assets that we have. And those Americans who have been to Malaysia know what I mean. We have uh, last year 220,000 American tourists uh, coming to Malaysia to enjoy the good weather, the good food, uh, the good scenery, eco tourism, the, the beaches. So we hope uh, more Americans will come to Malaysia. And there's a lot of goodwill, as I said, more than 100,000 Malaysians have, have studied here in the last uh, 40 years. Yeah? Uh, and that's a big help. I mean, you are here for four years, you have friends, you know the system here. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, a big reservoir of goodwill uh, that we have in Malaysia. So. Malaysia is in the center of uh, ASEAN, center of Asia, in between China uh, and India. Uh, we speak English. Uh, Americans are most welcome to Malaysia. Yeah. Well, as an American who's been coming to Malaysia for about 25 years, I can I can attest to everything you just said. It's a, it's a fantastic place to yeah, visit. Those who live in Malaysia uh, know what I mean. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, as we say, uh, to know Malaysia is to love Malaysia. <laughs> Malaysia is truly uh, Asia, uh, if you uh, happen to uh, not only uh, visit Malaysia but more importantly live in Malaysia, then you know that we are nice people, Yeah, we are open to foreigners, we are an open and tolerant society and this has got to do with the education that we get because Malaysians are everywhere. You go to China, you have Malaysian students, Australia, in India, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, Poland, Russia, UK. Canada, you name it, we have Malaysians everywhere, and all these Malaysians will come. Many of them come, not all, <laughs> many will come back. Yeah. Um, to, uh, they'll bring back with them the qualifications, the experience, and I think that's one reason why Malaysia is a dynamic society, because we have encouraged our people to go out and, you know, go anywhere in the world to get a good education. We have Malaysians in Germany who speak French, who speak German, Malaysians in, in France doing engineering. Malaysians in, in Japan, in Korea, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysians are everywhere and many of them uh, come back. And I think that adds to the dynamism of Malaysia. And there are many Malaysians who understand America well. Mm -hmm. Minister, I really want to thank you for your time. The, your country is lucky to have you out there on point and uh, I wish you every success in your Thank you for your good wishes.